Um, welcome to the Forum on the Humanities in the Public World, sponsored by the Townsend Center for the Humanities. My name is Tony Cascardi. I'm the Townsend Center Director. Thank you all very much uh, for coming this afternoon. When we began the forum uh, as a project a f few years ago, it was our intention and our hope to bring the work of contemporary writers, artists, um, and intellectuals, and not only of academics, into the conversation about the humanities and uh, at Berkeley, uh, and at the same time to establish and help bring out into relief the particular importance of the humanities for conversations about such things as the public good, questions about values, and broadly conceived understandings of the basic mission of a great public research university such as Berkeley is. In the course of this time, we've had the privilege of hosting quite an array of individuals in the forum, ranging from performing artists such as Alfred Brendel and Anna DeVere Smith, to legal scholars such as Bruce Ackerman and policymakers Robert Reich. But I would say that all along the way, we had in mind something like an ideal type for the forum, the kind of person one would unhesitatingly recognize as a public intellectual, the kind of person whose range of interests and scope of work could truly speak to public issues from the perspective of the humanities. And although it took a while before we could actually bring him to Berkeley, there was never any doubt in our minds that Terry Eagleton was exactly such an individual. Many of you will know him as the foremost Marxist literary theorist of recent decades. And many of you likewise will have personal experiences and memories of the charged debates that were sparked by the publication of his challenging little book, Literary Theory and Introduction, little in size only, rest assured. Others will recognize that the ideology of the aesthetic was among a handful of works that helped drive humanity scholarship in its very significant recent aesthetic turn. But Terry Eagleton has truly an astounding range and number of publications. Uh, these are only some of the, 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 the scantest highlights. And indeed, if there is a more prolific literary critic writing today, I don't want to know it. <laughs> um, he told me over lunch about his books for 2011, 12, and 13. He has written, indeed, an astounding number uh, of works, but not only of uh, academic scholarship and theory. Among them, also a memoir entitled The Gatekeeper a play, St. Oscar, about Oscar Wilde, and the script for what began as a television program and ended up as Derek Jarman's film, Wittgenstein. He has taught uh, widely at the universities of Manchester and Oxford and now visits regularly at the University of Notre Dame. Most re recently, his attention has turned toward questions of violence and religion and related subjects. He's published Holy Terror in 2005, the Trouble with Strangers, A Study of Ethics, 2008, Reason, Faith, and Revolution, Reflections on the God Debate, and just released from Yale University Press, Evil. I'd like to leave you, before turning the podium over to him, with a brief quotation from his After Theory of 2003. Cultural theory as we have it, he writes, promises to grapple with some fundamental problems, but on the whole fails to deliver. It has been shamefaced about morality and metaphysics, embarrassed about love, biology, religion, and revolution, largely silent about evil, reticent about death and suffering, dogmatic about essences, universals, and foundations, and superficial about truth, objectivity, and disinterestedness. This, on any estimate, is a rather large slice of human existence to fall down on. His talk this afternoon is entitled, The Death of Criticism. Please join me in welcoming Terry Eagleton. It was with great pleasure that I dedicated my book on evil to Henry Kissinger. <laughs> um, well, it's delightful to be back in Berkeley. Um, the first time I clapped eyes on the place, I realized, was in 1970. Well, clapped eyes might be something of an exaggeration, given the smoke and the tear gas. Um, maybe history is about to repeat itself. Who knows? Um, literary critics like myself live in a sort of permanent state of dread, really. I mean, a fear that one day some clerk in a government office idly 
turning over a leaf, will stumble on the shameful truth that we're actually paid for reading poems, novels, and plays. I mean, struck by the fact that this is every bit as scandalous as being paid for, you know, having sex or sunbathing, the clerk will throw himself on the phone to his superior and blow the whistle on the lot of us. You know, erstwhile experts in Jane Austen will be fixing computers and will all be rounded up and you know, made to labor in the countryside. The open secret, of course, of literary studies being that it's far too pleasurable an activity to be a bona fide discipline. But the scandal isn't, the scandal cuts deeper than that, really. It's not only that we're paid for reading books, we're actually paid outrageously for reading books about people who never existed and events that never took place. In ordinary life, talking about people who never existed is known as psychosis. Um, in universities, it's called literary criticism. Um, uh, uh, quantum physicists work on entities that may or may not exist. There seems to be some doubt about the matter. And the same, of course, applies to theologians. There are debates among sociologists as to whether, say, the Bank of England exists in the same sense that banknotes do, or whether it's just an assemblage of you know, chairs and filing cabinets and people and so on. Um, uh, the mathematicians of a platonic turn of mind uh, hold that you know, numbers are somehow actually out there along with, you know, Madonna and the Grand Canyon and various other phenomena, uh, whereas, you know, other mathematicians hold that numbers are no more out there than the concept of crimson is. Speaking of Madonna, by the way, as I frequently find myself doing, um, and I beg of you not to let this go beyond these four walls, you know, I, I hope that's not a camera there at the back. Um, I actually, uh, I actually once slept in her bed. <laughs> she wasn't there herself. But she hadn't been there for a very long time. Incidentally, anybody who would like the background to that story, if you approach me privately later for a very modest fee, I will, uh, I will feel it. I mean, even you know, maverick archaeologists in search of the lost uh, island of Atlantis, or you know, astrophysicists who surmise that there may be an infinity of universes, each, if we're unfortunate, equipped with its Dick Cheney. You know, even they may just be onto something, but we, alas, are onto nothing at all. You know, uh, there never was anybody called, you know, Emma Woodhouse or Emma Bovary, and a particularly bitter twist this: even if there were, it would make no difficult difference to the kind of things that critics say about them, for literary theoretical reasons too tedious to go into here. Um, critics don't have the satisfaction of working on things that indubitably exist, you know, like uh, sick dogs or, or dental cavities. I suppose you might say cultural critics work on things that exist called cultures, you know, particularly these days minority cultures. My wife and um, two of my five children who are American, my wife and two of my children are American, belong to that most bitterly persecuted minority of all in this country, those Americans who have not been abducted by aliens. You know, I mean, it really is a oh, terrible life. You know, the people turn their backs on them, they're shunned from various clubs, they can't get various welfare benefits, you know, that are handed out. Um, aliens, of course, are, this is a diversion, as you may have noticed, but so, but so is the whole paper. Ali aliens, um, you know, just how extraordinarily humanoid aliens seem to be. You know, that they're, I mean, uh, you know, they might be only three foot high and green and smell of sulfur and have no nose, but basically they you know, look like Tony Blair, really, pretty <laughs> much. Um, aliens are merely testimony to the paucity of the human imagination, aren't they? You know, we can't get beyond ourselves, really. So literary critics are tempted then, I suppose, to, to make a virtue of necessity to tough it out and to argue that working on things that don't exist is even more valuable than working on things that do. And this is known, in a word, as the creative imagination. Yeah? The creative imagination, of course, being one of those phrases that everybody on the planet seems to find unequivocally positive, like, you know, 
have another Guinness, or uh, you know, let's shoot the Duke of Edinburgh, or you know, something like that. Um, well, everybody apart from me, I think, I'm afraid, I'm in a minority there, since um, I don't share this unqualified enthusiasm for the creative imagination, which is a faculty surely capable of projecting all kinds of dark and diseased scenarios, as well as uh, quite positive ones. I mean, serial killing, I take it, uh, requires a good deal of imagination. But speaking of serial killing, uh, while I'm on that topic, as I often find myself doing, um, I wonder if it's absolutely blasphemous to suggest, I, I don't know what happens in the States, but certainly in Ireland, where I live, and in Britain, where I come from originally, um, uh, it always turns out you know, the victims of serial killers are happy, zesty, bubbly young people with hordes of friends and an enormously exciting future ahead of them. I mean, why do miserable people never get murdered? You know, I mean, have criminologists not made a connection between these two facts? You know, should not people who are zesty, bubbly, with hordes of friends, shouldn't they, shouldn't they walk warily at night? No, I would think, yes. Literary critics, don't they, sometimes commend the imagination as a sort of a kind of compensation for the paucity of real existence, as a kind of spiritual prosthesis, you might always say, um, by which we're able to enjoy in a vicarious kind of way the sort of experience denied to us in everyday life. I mean, if you don't have the money you know, for an air ticket to Indonesia or Malaysia, you can always read Joseph Conrad. Uh, you know, for some seriously strange literary critics, this is even more real you know, than being in Jakarta itself. Um, speaking of Indonesia, by the way, um, I wonder why it is that, um, you know, that, that for a long time, the United States positively supported and backed a vile dictator who almost certainly killed far more people than were killed by Saddam Hussein. Yes, uh, rather than say invading him in the name of freedom and democracy. Maybe he wasn't sitting on enough oil at the time. I wonder if that's the reason. Um, what sort of society is it, you might say, what, where um, what the possible is always superior to the actual? What comment does that make on actuality? Every lethal invention on record, of course, came about through uh, the envisaging of unrealized possibilities, through the imagination. If William Blake ranks among the visionaries, so does Pol Pot. Um, and it seems to me no accident that the th this particular theory of the imagination emerges pretty well, uh, is twinned at birth, emerges at the same time as industrial capitalism, where the lives of many millions of men and women did indeed seem to require a little spiritual supplementing. The origins, the historical origins of this concept, in other words, I think are a lot more disreputable than those who unequivocally celebrate it might realize. In fact, the origins, of course, go back further in English 18th century society. The imagination emerges as a way of compensating for what's felt to be the natural selfishness or individualism of human beings. I mean, if you have a sort of rather disreputable epistemology whereby all I can really know of you is you, know, you being a sort of fat patch on my eyeball, um, then how can I ever come to know you? Aren't we forever cut off from each other by the solid walls of our bodies? Um, if this is the case, then it would seem there would be a need for some sort of rather quirky, special, intuitive, elusive faculty, perhaps akin to aesthetic taste, uh, which will allow me to transport my sense, myself beyond my body, beyond my senses, project myself empathetically into you, into the interiority of you, which is the real you, and know what you're feeling. This theory of imagination, which is really, I suppose, born of a flawed epistemology, is alive and well as late as George Eliot in England, though not, I think, as late as Thomas Hardy. It's a faculty which 
makes up for our natural indifference to one another. You have to smuggle it in, in some really rather unarguable way, because the consequences socially and personally otherwise would be rather dire. It's a strange idea of the body, isn't it, which is that we're a, it's essentially a prison house that cuts the self off from other selves, who are equally immured within their flesh, like lifers in a cell. Uh, phenomenologically speaking, the body, of course, is a way of being present to other people, is a way of being in the world, of being among things, so that to inhabit a body, if that's the right term, uh, is already, as it were, to be open to an outside just as, as it were, to inhabit a language is inherently and intrinsically to be open towards an outside, or rather that both body and language, understood properly, dismantle that rather dubious distinction between inside and outside. I wonder what a sadist, for example, would make of the idea that knowing what you're feeling will move me to change my behavior. Um, on the contrary, the sadist might, might just take it as a cue to carry on. Um, brutality on this view is a breakdown of the imagination, of the sympathetic imagination. Um, and, but knowing what you're feeling, of course, won't necessarily inspire me to treat you any differently. I may, in fact, need to know how you're feeling in order to exploit you more effectively. Uh, the Nazis knew perfectly well what their victims were feeling. It's just that they didn't care. Um, I could rescue you from, say, being chewed by a shark without the slightest idea of what being chewed by a shark feels like. Morality has very little to do with feeling and experience, a romantic error par excellence. As Ludwig Wittgenstein once remarked, love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. Anyway, the imagination is thought, isn't it, to be among the most noble and edifying and prophetic of faculties, but it's also unnervingly close to fantasy, which is among the most infantile and lowly of them. I mean, poets are just, you know, those big babies who've never really ceased to relish the joys of babbling, you know, to rolling words on their tongue. Um, so, it may be, given the problems with the theory of imagination, it may be perhaps that criticism is in need of some rather more robust rationale than this. Although we could always ask, of course, why it should need a rationale in the first place. You know, um, why reading poems and novels should need any more justification than you know, eating chocolate or sunbathing. Isn't the whole point of the arts, on this theory, that they're gloriously pointless? Yes, and that this is their deepest rationale in a social order for which nothing that lacks utility or an instant exchange value can really be said to exist properly at all. If that's so, then the arts on this romantic and post-romantic theory of them join a very rare class of things um, which exist autotelically, that's to say, which exist entirely for themselves, which have their ground, end, origin, raison d'etre entirely in themselves. The first of those things, of course, is God, um, whose existence depends entirely entirely on himself. Then there's art, which is, among other things, a displaced kind of theology from the mid-18th century or late 18th century onwards. Almost every aesthetic term is a displaced theological one. There's evil, which, as I argue in this remarkably cheap and extraordinarily attractive book of mine, as well, is, is, is best understood as being autotelic, as being, as it were, ju done just for the hell of it, to use a technical theological term, um, um, and which in that sense, again, has an unnerving resemblance to good, because, of course, God also created the universe just for the hell of it, just for the delight and love of it, for no particular purpose. That is to say that he's traditionally seen as an artist and not as some kind of Victorian manufacturer. 
Um, maybe, maybe art is part of that, part of that strange and peculiar and rare and privileged class of phenomena, as it seems to keep conjuring itself up effortlessly from its own unfathomable being, you know, with no apparent end or purpose or goal in mind other than its own self-delight, and that then gives the cue for yet another and final member of this class, namely men and women, human beings, or rather, human beings as they might be in transformed political conditions. In different political conditions, they too might be released from the dreariness and drudgery of exchange value and a purely instrumental rationality and utility, no longer have to justify their powers and capacities at the tribunal of some grim-faced judgment or history or geist or production, and instead simply live in their capacities uh, for its own sake. That, of course, is absolutely the ethics, the political ethics of Karl Marx. I thought you'd expect me to mention him at least once, so there it is. But also, of course, of Thomas Aquinas, conception of virtue, and Aristotle, uh, by whom, of course, Marx was very influenced. To live for the hell of it, to turn yourself into a work of art, as Oscar Wilde might have said, is in this conception uh, indivisibly aesthetic and moral, let's say. Well, Returning, if I ever started, to the question of the criticism, you know, what are its functions? Two classical functions for criticism are surely fairly obvious. What, um, the first is that whatever else literary critics get up to, they inquire into the workings of language. And since language is the prime medium in which we come into our own as human subjects, though it's arguable we'll never be entirely at home there, um, one might do work worse than claim that critics are those who attend to the texture and intricacy of that which in large part makes us what we are. And that's you know, not a task to be sniffed at. The other classical function of literature or criticism, however, is far more general than that. And one of the problems is it's not easy to put it together with that first function. And that, I suppose, is to provide um, a humane critique, whatever you want to call it, of, uh, of the culture as a whole. And here, as I'll be arguing later, the role of the critic begins to shift imperceptibly into the task of the intellectual, so-called. Now, the oldest form of criticism on record has absolutely no problem in bringing these two apparently discrete faculties together. It was known to classical antiquity as rhetoric, and the very word rhetoric, of course, still means both the discipline study of tropes and figures and the art or science of publicly effective and persuasive speech, institutional speech, if you like. So criticism from the outset, you might argue, was textual and political together. Um, you know, it was at once a matter of grasping language as a play of metaphor, and it was a practical, institutional, in the broad sense, political affair. If you wanted to win your lawsuit or argue a political case, then professional rhetoricians were on hand to instruct you in the most effective way of doing it. Um, rhetoric then, I suppose in our terms today, was a kind of meta-discourse, or discourse theory, with an ethical dimension, of course, to it as well. For Cicero, if not for the sophists, speaking well and acting well are hard to, def to, d to divide, closely allied. Now, this whole conception of criticism, in which each function, as it were, worked into the other, was gradually undermined by a whole set of historical factors, and here follows a one-sentence history of modernity. Um, the growth of printing, the decline of the public sphere, the privatization of poetry, the rationalist or empiricist suspicion of figurative language. I think there was a member of parliament in, in Westminster in the 17th century who tried to ban metaphor by act of Parliament. Uh, um, the bureaucratization of politics, the automatization of the literary text, and so on. Right. Um, with the growth of, of what we might broadly call middle class society, uh, truth becomes redefined 
as non-dialogical, non-poetic, non-contextual, non-affective. Um, with the rise of the middle classes. You've noticed that if you open a history textbook at any point whatsoever, doesn't matter about the period, it will always say three things. Um, it was a period of rapid change. Um, it was effectively a transitional epoch and the middle classes went on rising. That's what God put the middle classes on earth to do, you know, like the sun or bread, you know, just to keep them right. But then at a certain point, they do come down again. Um, in our own epoch, uh, of course, rhetoric has come to mean specious, bombastic, manipulative speech, the property of both autocrats and advertisers. And I understand that over here, it means putting semicolons into freshmen's papers, which is <clears throat> a bit of a come down from Cicero, but there we are. <laughs> Incidentally, I think that somebody might should write an essay on the strange death of the colon, shouldn't they? Not, not death by colon, I'm sure there are <laughs> quite a few essays on that in medical journals. But the strange, whatever happened to the colon? You know, there could be campaigns of, you know, people waving placards, you know, about let the colon live and so on, <laughs> resurrect the colon. Yet despite uh, that not very encouraging history, as far as the, you know, the history of criticism goes, I think it's fair, isn't it, to claim that uh, every major moment in the history of criticism, from the Enlightenment to Romanticism to, you know, the so-called early 20th century Cambridge School, indeed to contemporary literary theory, um, has tried to reinvent in its own fashion this elusive spot at which, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, language and power, sensibility and society intersect. So that what one might call the paradigmat paradigmatic act of criticism for this modern history displays a kind of dual responsiveness. On the one hand, uh, to the grain and texture of language and um, simultaneously to the historical forces which go into its constitution. Surely, surely something like that double optic is the hallmark of the great, the towering critics of, this, of the 20th century from Bakhtin and Auerbach and Benjamin and Empson and Sontag uh, and Kristeva and, and uh, Trilling uh, and Edward Said onwards. For F.R. Leavis, that astonishingly pathbreaking and courageous Cambridge critic who's become a whipping boy for a literary left that knows exceedingly little about him. The sensuous enactment of experience in poetic language is a living scandal to an industrial capitalist order governed by abstraction and utility. Poetry, poetic language is, though perhaps Leavis wouldn't quite put it in these terms, is political in itself. For I.A. Richards, his Cambridge colleague, the delicate equipoise of impulses in a poem offers a corrective to an urban environment in which those impulses are no longer harmoniously integrated. Something similar, perhaps, might be said of the American New Criticism. And whatever one thinks about the politics of that, I think there's no doubt here that the acme of criticism in the early and mid 20th century, there's no doubt that criticism is regarded as an implicit political critique and that that is not defined as separate from its responsibility to the so-called words on the page. At this point, the words on the page are by no means an alternative to historical or political analysis as they will shortly become. Now, it might be possible to carry on this story by claiming that after this historical point, criticism loses this dual function by going abstract and that that is the moment of theory. Well, may be, but the notion that literary theory can't cope with, with the sensuous particularity of a text is, in my view, as much a cliche, as much as, as a, a, a cliche, as the very commonplace assumption, at least where I come from, I don't know about over here, that um, you can always identify a terrorist because, first of all, he looks just like you and me. He always has a polite word for his neighbors but he keeps himself to himself. Yes. Astonishingly, terrorists are not mad-eyed, shaggy, hairy, schizoid creatures, you know, who go around with Kalashnikovs on their back. They look exactly like you and me. You know. 
mysterious. Um, anyway, I won't bore you with a list of literary theorists who are marvelously close readers, since it would have to include almost every well-known figure, from Kristeva and Jameson and Hillis Miller to Bart, Adorno, Sixou, Derrida. There you are, I've given you the list. I said I wouldn't do it. Um, indeed, my case would be um, that uh, the moment of theory, which, as I argue in my astonishingly cheap book, After Theory, is now pretty well behind us and coincided with the brief moment of the ascendancy of the political left in the 20th century from, say, roughly 1965 to 1985, that that moment was the last major attempt to reinvent or re-envisage the classical conception or a conjuncture between language and power. It was thoroughly in line, in my, in my clearly partisan view, with that honorable lineage from, from ancient rhetoric. It is, in other words, so-called theory, which is thoroughly traditional, just as all authentic radical politics is traditional. We Marxists have always lived in tradition, as uh, Trotsky said. It's theory which is fully tr uh, traditional with its slogan, you know, forward to antiquity. And it's the various textualisms and formalisms which are, you know, the, the blow-ins and the carpetbaggers and the johnny come latelys and the upstarts. Now, if this high theoretical project, however, is now rapidly receding into history, I think it is for reasons relevant to what I've been saying of the functions of criticism. For one thing, uh, the art of minutely dissecting discourse is now almost as dead on its feet as clog dancing. That would have got a laugh in Britain, but don't worry. As I, I'm very thick-skinned, and you know they pay my travel expenses, and it doesn't matter. Um, and I would suggest that that has precious little to do with the advent of theory, and a lot to do with a late capitalist culture for which experience itself has now become heritage, commodity, instant consumption, speciously transparent truth. You know, experience in that fetishized capital E. I live in Ireland quite close to the Giants Causeway and um, occasionally have to run people out there. And um, I just feel very sad for all those millions of tourists who've been to the Giants Causeway but didn't have the Giants Causeway experience, you see, which you can now have, you know, with a very large E, you know, it's all laid on for you. Um, uh, Walter Benjamin, I think, understood that among the more tangible deprivations of modernity, it was this capacity of the system to impoverish experience itself, you know, plundering men and women of their very subjectivity, scooping them out like so many plums, uh, which might in the end prove most grievous. What we have to fear is not really, I think, the death of history, uh, which has, has, of course, been prematurely announced several times. Hegel believed with his customary modesty that history had now culminated inside his own head. Um, but with a typical, with a characteristic irony, that attempt to shut history down simply resulted in opening it up again as you know, Kierkegaard and Marx and Nietzsche and many other people responded to that, thus perpetuating the very history that they thought had been, that Hegel thought had been closed. Similar thing, surely, <coughs> isn't there with the end of history, so-called, Fukuyama and all that. Um, marvelous irony there that um, the announcement that history with a large H has come to an end which I suppose says, among other things, that the Western capitalist narrative is now so global and pervasive that, like any narrative which stretches from wall to wall, it can't recognize the presence of any other narrative, because narratives to be narratives, like for people to be people, have to be able to bounce off some other narrative. So if you globalize it, then it's very hard not to think you know, that no other narrative will be possible. But that, that um, intellectual announcement, if one can grace it with that term, reflected a political triumphalism, especially on the part of the United States after the Cold War, which 
created then a backlash in the form of unleashing a new grand narrative. Because if radical Islam isn't a grand narrative, it's hard to know what is. In other words, the very act of trying to close down or arrogantly and hubristically announcing that history had been closed down uh, actually managed to spark off another again, not least in the wake of 9-11. Uh, I mean, of course, um, the second 9-11, not, not the first 9-11, and uh, not 9-11 uh, to the day before the World Trade Center, not 9-11-1971, when the United States violently overthrew the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende of Chile and installed in its place an odious dictator who went on to kill far more people than ever were killed in the World Trade Center. It's not so much the death of history then, it's rather, I suppose, for people like Benjamin and others, the threatened death of experience, which then speaks urgently to the matter of art. Um, uh, a demise which for Benjamin, I suppose, will be achieved largely by eradicating the very medium of experience itself, namely memory. And this in turn would of course involve eradicating a great deal of the future because those who eradicate or attempt to ignore or uh, simply turn their backs on the past are turning their backs on vital possible resources for the future. Um, as Benjamin remarks uh, in his Judaic way, it's not dreams of liberated grandchildren that stir men and women to revolt, it's memories of enslaved ancestors. Only by turning to the past can you recoup the energies that might propel you into the future. Um, if I may go back to the point about the first function of criticism, the analysis of discourse then, um, in my experience, students today uh, literary students, they are, are pretty good at spotting, say, an ethnic or a gender stereotype, but they can't, for the most part, say things like, the poem's exuberant tone is curiously at odds with its shambling syntax. <laughs> They just think that was funny, which you do too. It is actually, isn't it? There's, there is something funny about that. Um, you know, they would just greet that sort of thing with a sort of sheepish silence one reserves for people who ask if you've been washed in the blood of the lamb. <laughs> Um, and yet, you know, not to be able to say things like that, not to be able to say things like that, is a grievous disability, isn't it, for a literary critic? It's like an engineer who can't add up, you know, who's got no idea of arithmetic. Most students today, most literary students today, would be nonplussed by the critic who said of a passage in T.S. Eliot, there's something very sad about the punctuation. Um, Tone, mood, address, pitch, pace, syntax, texture, timbre, the like. I mean, if students today are mostly ignorant of these things, staring right the way through them to look at the content, which may be interesting, but certainly isn't literary criticism, if they do that, then I suppose it's partly not because they're untalented or unintelligent by any means, but because quite a lot of their teachers do that as well. Um, something happened in that critical history. Um, and I don't think it was the advent of theory, which certainly, as far as textual particularity goes, is often in its best exponents very tenacious. Somebody might say about Derrida, might they, that he's too close to the text. You know, that there's a certain myopia. Of, I, I don't necessarily say this myself, but the question of how far you have to stand in relation to the text isn't itself an interesting critical question. So language, not just as a structure of meaning, but as force, experience, practice, performance, you know, sensuous enactment, the home of being, all of that um, has, I think, been surrendered very largely to those who are virulently hostile to the other traditional function of criticism, namely um, it, 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 its broadly political one. Yet I think that if criticism is in crisis, it's partly because that too is in crisis, not just the, as it were, verbal and analytic function, but this as well. And to understand why this is so, we have to glance briefly at the concept of the intellectual. Intellectual does not, of course, mean frightfully clever. 
uh, <laughs> if it did, there would be no dim-witted intellectuals, and that is far from being the case. You know, there are dim intellectuals just as there are bright truck drivers. Yeah, uh, the term is more of a job description than a you know, personal commendation. Um, yet, um, I don't think either, at least not for me, that it just means um, those who professionally trade in ideas uh, a little too charitable uh, at inclusion, I think, because that would actually let in academics. Um, and in my view, um, I, you know, with the greatest respect to everybody here, um, academics are almost the reverse of intellectuals. For example, Academics tend, of course, to restrict their scholarly labors, this is not a criticism, this is just what they do, uh, to a fairly narrow patch, single uh, specialism. When I was a student at Cambridge a long time ago, um, one of my hobbies was sort of um, reading my way through the enormous book that contained the titles of all the theses, being PhD theses being studied in all the faculties just to find the most you know, surreally pedantic of them. And the, the one that won by mile was um, some aspects of the vaginal system of the flea. <laughs> like that, some aspects, don't you know? You know nothing too overreaching, you know, uh, very, kind of very, very, very English modesty about it, you know, uh, you know nothing brash, you know, leave something to, to posterity. You know, you know. Um, well, that's just the kind of thing academics do, isn't it? Not necessarily that they examine the flea. I mean, you know, one, we need a pretty good eyesight for that kind of thing. Um, but um, intellectuals, of course, tend to move more promiscuously, don't they, from one patch or discourse or discipline to another, um, so that if the former, if academics risk pedantry, uh, intellectuals risk amateurism, um, intellectuals cross disciplines, um, not to show how versatile they are, uh, but because they're concerned with the bearing of ideas on society as a whole, and that requires them to be, as it were, conversant in more than one kind of intellectual discipline, as academics may be, but don't, I think, professionally have to be. Now, historically speaking, I think the function, the social function of being a public intellectual has actually shifted around from one academic patch to another. In classical antiquity, as I've argued, it was among other things the job of the rhetorician, but also perhaps of the philosopher. In the medieval period, it becomes effectively the monopoly of the theologian. In the age of enlightenment, not least in continental Europe, it's the philosophe, it's the philosopher who stands at the crossroads of you know, various kinds of conceptual traffic. Um, throughout the 19th century, uh, as the natural sciences become increasingly definitive of knowledge as such, it's science, it's the natural sciences, the chemist or the physicist, uh, or the biologist who shifts nearer to the fulcrum of public debate, public consciousness. But since science is thought to have a problem in handling value, uh, that role of public intellectual must be carved up, must be shared with the so-called sage or man of letters or moralist, somebody who mediates between literature, ethics, philosophy, um, in order to keep a humane discourse alive in the teeth of a certain kind of scientific positivism. And I suppose it's not really, is it, until the early, 19, early 20th century, the age of Leavis and, and, and Empson uh, and Edmund Wilson, the early or middle of the century, that the critics turn to occupy this public slot actually comes up. And there are a number of reasons for that, I think, which I can only briefly skim here, some of them rather disreputable reasons. Um, for one thing, the idea of culture begins from 1900 onwards to move, of course, to become much more of a salient, of a dominant notion. That, I think, is effectively for three reasons. One is fairly obvious, the emergence of the so-called culture industry around that time. That is to say, the point at which culture finally becomes almost entirely integrated into general commodity production, of which postmodernism, so-called, will be the acme, the consummation. Second, and deeply important reason, the attempt of a certain notion of culture to stand in for what in Europe, at least, 
not in the godly United States, but in Europe, was an increasingly failing religion. Culture is in all kinds of ways, as a concept, equipped to do that, but uh, part of its crisis, crisis-like nature is that it failed uh, effectively. No, no human symbolic system has ever been able to hold a candle to religion. The most potent historical symbolic system of all, of all which can, you know, make an immediate connection between, as it were, the daily quotidian practices of millions upon millions of people with the most uh, imposing trans transcendent truths. Culture tried and failed to do that during the 19th and perhaps first half of the 20th century, if I'll leave this, perhaps marks a certain end point there. And the third reason, I suppose, for the increasing salience of culture as the, 19th, as the 20th century ran its course was the fact that if you looked at the three most um, powerful uh, political forms, I mean radical political forms, um, First of all, by far, I mean, the most astonishingly successful revolutionary movement of modernity itself, not just of the 20th century, revolutionary nationalism, which detached one society after another in the mid 20th century from the various traditional empires. If you look at the women's movement, if you look at various forms of ethnic politics, what is surely say, shared by them all is the fact that culture is now the very language in which political demands are shaped and articulated. I mean culture in the broad sense of history, tradition, symbol, idiom, community, and so on. I don't mean, you know, and so much so, of course, that we get to a point quite rapidly where culture can be defined as that for which people are prepared to die. That for which people will kill, absolutely no doubt about it, and that for which they will die. I don't mean, you know, they're prepared to kill and die for, you know, Schoenberg and Thomas Mann, there may be a few, you know, seriously weird people hanging around in caves somewhere who have that view. Uh, but culture has that much, takes on that much importance. Um, and that means that <coughs> culture has shifted over in the mid 20th century onwards from being part of the solution to being part of the problem. In a certain liberal humanist conception of it, culture cut through to the common ground where we could all meet, irrespective of our relatively trivial uh, social differences. That was a, a deeply effective ideology of the traditional bourgeoisie. And don't forget that what distinguishes a Marxist is his or her undying admiration for the revolutionary heritage of the middle class, the greatest revolutionary force in history, as Marx uh, acknowledged. Um, at the same time as that notion of culture was also too abstract. You needed it to be tangibly crystallized or distilled. You needed something you could hold in your hand and say, this this fundamentally is what we live by, and the name of that was, was literature or art. Yes, that gave a sensuous and concrete embodiment to those values, not least so that if you were, you know, part of the British Raj, whatever it was, you could take that overseas and show the natives, so-called, what you finally lived by. A highly conveniently portable version of one's civilization. So I think that for those particular reasons, the literary intellectual gains an unwanted and in some ways rather alarming prominence from that period onwards. Um, you know, um, and, and because literary studies are of, one might say politely, of such a low profile, which is to say less politely because it's very hard to say what the hell they are about, you know, what any discourse that ranges from death to dactyls or, you know, what that's about. Because of that, it was peculiarly hospitable to taking on this role. Moreover, it, there, were there was a negative reason for that, namely that the, the, discipl the surrounding disciplines were less and less capable of doing so. That if you were confronted with an empiricist philosophy and a positive of his sociology, a utilitarian ethics, a discredited theology, and so on, then the buck had to be passed somewhere, and it was passed to, to people who have been trained, you know, in how to spot a shift
shift in tone in a poem, you know, um, uh, and who now suddenly began holding forth on the unconscious, the construction of gender, the Asiatic mode of production, uh, and so on. Um, now, I suppose in a certain sense that amateurism didn't matter so much as, as long as critics were fairly harmless kinds of people, you know. Um, you know, uh, you could tolerate a spot of imprecision as you wouldn't in, say, uh, you know, brain surgery or, you know, aeronautical engineering, for example. Um, but at the moment, critics began claiming a certain rather portentous public role for themselves, certain problems began to follow. So my, to, to conclude, my point there simply is that cultural theorists are perhaps the latest form of traditional public intellectual, a, a bit of a worrying fact for old-fashioned materialists like myself, uh, for whom culture has a sort of inherent tendency as a concept to get out of hand. It's very hard, isn't it, to get culture as a concept into focus. It, it's almost, uh, one almost always ends up either overrating it or undervaluing it. And to that extent, it's rather like sexuality. And that's the only bit of this lecture you'll remember in two weeks' time. <laughs> Um, there's now, of course, a rampant uh, uh, hyperbolization of the concept of culture known as culturalism, postmodern culturalism, for which culture goes all the way down. Culture is wall to wall. There is nothing that is not cultural, which, to my mind, simply empties the concept of any usable meaning the more it's stretched beyond endurance. I wouldn't want to argue that uh, culture is where it's at. Indeed, it strikes me that standing as we do on the edge of a new, on the brink of a new millennium, the problems that actually uh, confront humanity are rather, um, rather boringly, but also rather alarmingly, much the same old material problems that confronted it um, on the brink of the first millennium. Poverty, disease, war, famine, we've thrown in a few fashionable new ones like, you know, nuclear weapons just to make our mark, you know, on history. Um, uh, they're not in any specific sense, it seems to me, cultural problems at all. Well, they're cultural in the, in the boring, expanded sense of the ca category, which includes everything. But they don't have any, not, not a cultural cutting edge to them. It seems to me that it's not true that our nature is culture, as the culturalists would want to maintain. It does seem to me that, our, that culture is of our nature, in the sense that we're all born prematurely that we're all born helpless, we're all, bo all born with a huge hole in our nature, and unless culture in the extended sense of care and kinship moves in on us straight away, then we will most surely die. Culture has that kind of importance, but that's another story. Thank you very much. Uh, uh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I imagine there are many questions, uh, comments, uh, thoughts to follow this up. And if you do uh, would like to ask a question or make a comment, I'd like to request that you raise your hand, wait to be recognized, and then most important, wait for one of the microphones to reach you so that everyone in the room um, can hear your question or comment. We'll wait just a minute for people who have to exit. Um, Do you want to recognize the questions, or do you want me to call on people? I could do that. Okay. Could, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just make them wait for the microphone. The microphone, yeah. Uh, as a Marxist, does Islamic terrorism lend itself to Marxist analysis or, be, or not because a religion is the opiate of the masses and you just write it off? Oh, I, think, I think there's a, bit of a great deal of serious attention by, by Marxist and other 
left political thinkers of late to, um, to, 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 to Islamic fundamentalism. Um, in any case, Marx, is, now, Marx wasn't just dismissive of religion. You see, the passage about the opium of the people, though you might argue that fundamentalism is the crack of the people. Um, you know, as they always say, when put in context, um, says religion is the heart of the heartless world. It is the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Marx had, um, Marx thought that religion uh, was the best sort of heart that a heartless society could manage. You know. um, um, the, um, I, I think it's also, but, but I take the point of what you're saying in the sense that it is, it does, it challenges a certain kind of reductionist Marxism, doesn't it? Because, of course, um, if ideology or culture is what people are prepared to kill for, if it's as central to their social and personal lives as that, then it's certainly not just some ideological reflex you know, that can be dismissed in that way. Uh, I mean, Mar I suppose that Marxism uh, let's not forget when we're talking about fundamentalism, we're talking about, you know, Texans as well as Talibans and other Americans and other people in Western Europe, you know, fundamentalism is by no means confined to Islam. Um, and, uh, but that, that when we're talking about that, we're talking, aren't we, essentially about, I suppose, about anxiety, that fundamentalism is the reflex, whatever form it takes, of an extremely deep-seated anxiety of people who feel you know, they've been sold out or washed up or left behind or trampled over, and from that anxiety comes hatred. You know, but as, as I, I think it's true, perhaps, that the opposite of love is not really hate, as uh, Leopold Bloom mistakenly says in Ulysses, uh, but it's fear. Um, and the other side of fundamentalism, the flip side of it, the flip side of all that ugly concentration on literal meaning and roots and our patch and our identity, is those who have no belief, no identity, who fly the skies, yes? Um, that uh, the world becomes divided between those who believe too much and those who believe too little. You know, the. Uh, uh, jet, I mean, ca capitalism, late capitalism, in my view, doesn't really demand much belief. It doesn't work by belief. As long as you roll out of bed and pay your taxes and don't shoot too many policemen and all that kind of thing, you know, the state doesn't mind what you believe. You believe what the hell you like, yes? As long as you're not a threat to it in some way. Um, uh, so that, um, I mean, it, uh, as often, America, United States is exceptional. It is a stridently ideological society, a stridently ideological society, which wears its ideology on its sleeve, yes? Um, which is not where ideology works best at all. But that, uh, and, uh, but that normally speaking, I think late capitalism is, is a faithless and, as it were, unbelieving, uh, form of life. It just is naturally secu secular, rational, relativistic, skeptical, and as far as belief goes, look at what people do. Don't look at what they say, you know, their hand on heart, you know, God and nation and all that stuff. You know, look at what they do in the marketplace. That will embody their real beliefs. But that in turn, that faithlessness which rides roughshod over other people's belief systems, sparks then, if you like, a fundamentalist backlash, and the world becomes caught between the two camps, in a sense. Yes, yeah. I'd uh, just like to ask you to comment briefly on um, just your perspective on the, the um, defamiliarization the, the aesthetic concept of defamiliarization that was so central to early 20th century Russian formalist theory. And the reason I ask is that you said that most aesthetic yeah. uh, terms for the, uh, in our tradition are displaced theological ones. And mm. that strikes me as strikingly not obviously the case mm. for defamiliarization, which of course belongs to a different context. Yes. So. yes. Well, two, two things very quickly. If um, 
uh, if defamiliarization is the, the, the aesthetic category par excellence, then the, fo the formalists have stumbled on the key to all mythologies. They've done what nobody else has ever been able to do, namely found a single central characteristic of all aesthetic discourses, yes. I don't think they did, actually. I don't think that defamiliarization, however you, however you stretch the concept and however important it undoubtedly is, is actually account for all kinds of aesthetic effects. I think it is, it is, though, in a very indirect sense theological, isn't it, in this sense, that like a lot of early 20th century devices, it reacts to what it sees as a boring, tarnished, prosaic, commonplace, everyday life. Art has to deviate from that kind of life in order to be effective. And that is a very, uh, a very specific and ideological view of the common life. It's not, for example, one shared by Bakhtin, you know, the colleague of the Russian formalist. Um, and I think in turn that that is, um, that is life without epiphany, you know, that is life without revelation and uh, in a sense life without grace. Um, you find something similar in Hopkins. Hopkins thinks that he can get something out of language only if he twists and turns and you know, stretches and compresses it. That sense that language in its ordinary existence is radically inauthentic and that you have to do violence to it to get something out of it is pervasive throughout the first, first decades, isn't it, of the 20th century. And I do think, well, that's got a lot to do with a, with a society in which language itself has become very tarnished through commercial and industrial and bureaucratic practices. But I think it's also a sort of world without revelation. And the, the act of estrangement is a sort of parody of a, a moment of a moment of revelatory insight or epiphany, if you like, but now in very hard-nosed materialist terms. Uh, yes? Ah, there's somebody over there, yes. Uh, <clears throat> when answering the first question, um, you mentioned fear. And how do, do you think that plays in um, the inability, possibly, of literary criticism, criticism to duplicate what theology was able to do, to do to in, in religion itself? To instill not necessarily fear itself, but that we live oh. under fear. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, I suppose the anxiety of influence is the nearest it's come. Isn't it? um, uh, well, of course, fear, fear is, is, a, is a quite often misunderstood theological term, isn't it? Particularly in some sort of radical Protestant circles. Um, you know, really that, you know, God's an old bastard, you know, and you've got to watch it, otherwise, you know, he'll finger you. Um, what's fearful about God, of course, is the ruthlessness of his love the sheer uncompromising ruthlessness of his mercy of forgiveness, which in the Hebrew uh, tradition, in the Hebrew Bible, is something that you can hardly bear. I mean, it, it's, it's hell. It's the fire of hell. The fire of hell is the love of God. It burns you up. Yeah? Um, so that the, um, the heretical image of the you know, there's the, there's the sort of, the, there's the old bastard of a god, you know, Nobo Daddy, uh, the old patriarch, and you have to suck up to him to be saved. But then there's also the nice, cuddly sort of god, you know, the cuddly side of God, you know, or, or his son, you know, is, of course, entirely heretical. It, it, it misses the fact that what is terrifying about God is that he is a terrorist of love. Yeah, and won't settle for half. And that sort of unconditional loving is just not anything that we can do. Yes. So I think fear has to be understood, you know, not as fear of the tyrant, but uh, fear of so fear of something which is just not familiar to us. And so, you know, um, the the image of God as the patriarch that you have to at all costs please and placate by obeying all the rules, I think is known in the Hebrew Bible as Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan is of course means in Hebrew accuser or adversary. It's it's not only those who see Yahweh in that way, but those who want to see him in that way, because being as we all are chronic masochists, you know, we want to be punished. <laughs> 
we want to unleash the death drive onto ourselves, and that might then allow us to expiate ourselves. But what's frustrating about God is that when these Pharisees of all ages come along and do all the right things, it turns out that what he says to them is, well, I love you anyway, and you didn't really need to, you know. It sort of pulls the carpet out a bit from under them, you know. They don't want that kind of God. It's all too easy, you know. They want a bit of robust, athletic, moral, you know. <laughs> Anybody? Yes. As young woman here. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. So I wondered, um, where does the literary critic stand on oral literatures and performance? Is it really the realm then of cultural critics? Um, apart from sometimes performing my own songs, I don't really know much about that, um, which I very much like to confine to, confine to the, keep to the oral tradition. I don't like them being written down, some sort of fetishistic thing about that. I don't know. Um, uh, um, I, I think that I, I think it ought to be part of the patch of the literary critic, you know, I, I, very much. I don't think it should be. We should have a division of labour there between the literary and the cultural, or the oral and, and the written, because they because the oral and the written so often play into each other, don't they? You know, um, there are different modes of the same thing in many ways. And my, the point about rhetoric, of course, among other things, is that criticism begins as a study of an oral type of culture, you know, which is not in the first place written at all. Yeah. Other questions? It's, uh, yeah. uh. Um, earlier I heard you mention something fictional as being less real than Madonna, which I found to be an interesting way of putting it because you know, at least to me, in a sense, Madonna is something of a fictional, you know, fictional identity worn by a real person. Um, I guess my question is, um, you know, for the cultural cr critic, um, you know, can you know, can a cult cultural critic apply, you know, apply cultural criticism to, you know, real to, you know, real people in real circumstances, or at least presentations of them as they would to fictional um, yeah. you know, people in circumstances, and you know, if so, how would such analyses differ? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think so, yes. I mean, also, um, actually, fic fictional doesn't necessarily mean not empirically true, does it? Indeed, some... Uh, some theorists of fiction could, would, might say, would say actually, that you could have um, a text that was entirely factually true but was also fictional. Fiction being, as it were, part of the way you relate yourself, part of the way you take that text, kind of question of uptake. Um, uh, so I, I think fictionality, which I'm trying to write on right now, is perhaps the hard, I certainly find the hardest branch of, of literary theory. Um, People who, philosophers who work on fictionality, as far as judging from the examples they give of fiction, have only ever read the Sherlock Holmes stories and the first sentence of Anna Karenina. Um, so they're not the best equipped, you know, in some ways. So, but it is very hard. But I think the question of truth and falsity and fictionality, you see, fiction doesn't need to be f empirically false, does it? Um, it to say a text is fictional is to say, among other things, how we should, what we should do with it, yes. For example, I think that there is implicit in the idea of fictionality the notion that we should somehow generalize this meaning, yes. We shouldn't take it just as this particular story about this particular person, yes. There's the, the, this is most obvious in allegory, but there's a sort of implicit generalization built in, and how that works is very hard to define, I think, you know. But I wouldn't want to say just straight off that fact and fiction are necessarily always opposed, and I wouldn't take that, I don't take that view for some fashionable postmodern reason, namely that facts are always fictions. I don't think that helps particularly. Uh, I, I think one, Mike. One more question? Yes, I think yes. Mike had a question there. Yes. If, if um, as you say, criticism is uh, dying, 
and you need someone with a dual optic to resuscitate it, uh, who would you propose besides yourself, Terry? As a, as a redeemer. As a <laughs> um, well, I suppose that one thing that happened, actually, Mike, was that, um, was, that was criticism went creative, didn't it? This is now rather a long time ago, but one of the many boundaries deconstructed by postmodernism or post-structuralism was between the, the creative writer, so-called, whatever that means, and, and the critic. And I do think that can be seen, among other things, among, perhaps among more positive things, as um, a rather last-ditch, desperate attempt, attempt to rescue mm. criticism from increasing irrelevance. I would answer your question like this, Mike. I think that um, it's not for us, it's not for the critic or indeed the artist to legislate the circumstances under which he or she might again become relevant. Ah. That's a matter of politics, roughly. Uh, it, people like um, Benjamin could, uh, could try to refunction, as he would say, the role of criticism uh, because people like Brecht existed and their, and their dramatic practice, because that in turn was part of a mass socialist movement in which had its own newspapers and theatres and, you know, that you can't legislate into existence. Certainly not intellectuals can do that. But, uh, I mean, the, av the, the great revolutionary avant-garde of the 20th century, not just in Weimar but in Russia, understood, didn't they, that without that being keyed into that kind of movement, they were finished. It was part of their own materialist doctrine that art couldn't do it by itself. Yeah. Well, I suggest that we thank Terry Eagleton as possible. Thank you. Thank you.